Warning, this video contains spoilers for Star Trek Discovery Season 1 and Star Trek Discovery Season 2. Star Trek Discovery Season 2, Episode 11, Perpetual Infinity. All of the plot points for Season 2 have finally been revealed, and while some of the things in this episode hurt my brain because I'm not an astrophysicist, I enjoyed a lot of the moments we had with our characters. Let's jump into it. I really enjoyed seeing the Burnham family together at the beginning of this episode. It was a nice touch to show how much they all cared for each other and to finally see the fateful events that shaped Michael's life. According to the show, five hours have passed since the last episode. I find it strange that nobody has bothered to look for Leland in that entire span of time. It's also completely unclear how the control AI has created nanobots, this floating drone, how Leland was moved into the chair, or even where this chair came from. Granted, I enjoyed Leland's acting in this scene, and I'm disappointed that his character, for all intents and purposes, is gone from the show. I think Dropican makes room for Giorgio to take over Section 31, but it's still sad to see him leave. In this episode, we are treated to another ticking clock, and this one, to me, made sense at first, but kind of fell apart at the end, but we'll get into that in a bit. The focus of this episode, and really the entire season, has to do with the Sphere Data Discovery downloaded back in a previous episode. I like that this plot point is being tied into the time war between Michael's mother, Gabrielle, and the future control AI because its existence did seem out of normal canon for Star Trek. Spock and Michael's relationship in this episode is really great. He is clearly understanding the pain and emotional turmoil his sister is going through and does a fantastic job at being her anchor and emotional support, even culminating in a fun game of chess at the end. I like science. Gabrielle Burnham's desire to only speak with Pike makes sense in the context of this episode, but I wanted to make a point to say that Pike stood his ground regarding their first conversation and that Burnham didn't try to disobey him in any way. The conversation with Michael and her mother show off the skill of our lead, Sonequa Martin-Green, and the actress Sonia Sun playing her mother. The ravage of time has clearly taken its toll on her mom, and the desire for a reunion for Michael are all played very well. Giorgio is on full display in this episode. All of her scenes are amazing, including the fight between her and Leland. I was legitimately on the edge when she figured out the situation with Leland and contacted Ash Tyler to fight back. It's important to note that the entire dialogue exchange from Ash and Giorgio seems almost completely out of character for him, but in a good way. He's no longer just somebody who's moping around and is seemingly constantly apologizing for his existence and his decisions here, and I really liked it. It honestly felt like someone else wrote these scenes, and it was a lot of fun. The showdown with future Leland, as he goes full Terminator, was again another sequence I was on the edge of my seat for. I knew Giorgio wasn't going to die, but I was legitimately concerned for Commander Nan. This was a sequence I thought a self-sacrifice was going to take place because she felt guilty over the Arium situation. My issue with this episode is that we learn that the time suit and crystal transports Michael's mother 950 years into the future at around the year 3183. And the suit always rips her back to that year no matter what. We also learn that Michael's mother uncovered the outcome of Future Control's plan to wipe out all sentient life and has been making regular trips into the past to try and prevent it with no success. Several things are not really explained. One is how long does her mother have before the anchor pulls her back to the future? Two, what is the purpose or origin of the anchor? Three, why is Control trying to destroy all sentient life forms? Four, once Leland destroys the time crystal, the anchor from the year 3183 still pulls Michael's mother's and the suit back, but it's not clear as to how because from the start of the episode, it's implied the time crystal is needed for the time jumps. Five, how did Michael's mother change the location of the anchor point to Terralysium, aka the planet from New Eden? And six, how was she able to witness things from Michael's past without actually being seen? Since every time the suit travels back in time that we've seen so far, there's a big red wormhole that pops up and the suit cannot cloak as far as we know. While I do feel that some of these issues will be explained in the follow-on episodes, I sadly do not think everything is going to be laid out for us to easily understand. Other things to note are, while I don't fully understand what is going on with Leland's body, it was cool to see the nanobots infecting his face. Dr. Culber has been fully reinstated, and while we haven't seen the full repair of his relationship with Stamets, I believe we're going to get it before the end of this season, and I'm happy for it. I was also glad to see his experience being a reincarnated version of himself have some tangible positivity to it when during the conversation with Michael about her mother not being the same woman that she once was. Tilly's jokes continue to fall flat for me and ultimately feel out of place. I think that's my biggest issue with them. Some of you mentioned that her joke in the previous episode about the doors was due to her feelings being out of whack from Arium's death. However, I would like to point out in the last three episodes, she told a joke in almost the exact same fashion, all of which seems to be inappropriate given the stakes surrounding the episodes. This is a classic example of Newton's third law of motion. 
Oh, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Sorry, it's just my second favorite law of physics. Um, sorry, uh, Captain, Admiral, everyone. I, I should have not. Although it, it is kind of pointless. These doors pretty much open right on their own most of the time. Admiral, Admiral, hello, hi. Lovely to see you. Um, I just wanted to tell you that I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a fugitive. I've never been a fugitive before. Except, well, when I was 16, I went through kind of a rebellious phase, and I uh, hacked into... Did you have something to report, Ensign? It's not to say that you cannot have humor in stressful scenes, as the banter between Giorgio and Tyler proved to us. The fight between Tyler and Leland was pretty cool, and I liked the scene in which he contacted Pike letting him know something was up. Some of you might ask why Pike didn't try to contact anyone else on the Section 31 ship to intervene and save Ash Tyler, but I would argue that there was a great chance nobody would listen to him, and that as far as he knows, there could be more infected crew on board that ship. We finally learn the reason those humans were saved from the past on Earth during World War III. Michael's mother seems to have made a home for herself on New Eden, which is, according to her, outside of the purview of future control. It seems as though she put these people on there for a long-term plan to ensure the survival of sentient life, while she worked to try to prevent the outcome altogether. The biggest reveal of this episode, in my opinion, is that Michael's mother isn't aware of the seven red bursts or their origin, so it's implying that something else is going on with the Red Angel's suit. My final thoughts are this. Time travel plots are really hard, for TV and movies. If you don't establish the ground rules up front, it can be difficult for the audience to understand the intricacies of your plot and potentially take them out of the experience of watching your production. The time anchor for Michael's mother is very strange to me. It doesn't make sense why she would be able to be pulled into the future again while not wearing the suit, or how the entire anchor point works without the time crystal at all. I hope they are going to explain more of this in detail in the upcoming episode so we can better understand what's happening. I am eagerly awaiting the outcome of the season and desperate to see how they all tie everything back together again. I would encourage all of you to keep an open mind until the final episode airs, and we fully understand the intricacies of this story being told. It's confusing now, but it may become clear at the finale.